Nestled in the quiet serenity in the foothills north of the great stupa of Bodhanath, the age-old tradition of prayers, study and meditation continue in Pulahari Monastery, side by side with teachings and meditation programs of the Rigpa Dorje Institute, attended by Buddhist students from all over the world. Pulahari, Hill of Clear Light Flowers, was named after the monastery of the great Indian master Naropa. It is located north of the holy place where the Buddha became enlightened in Bodhgaya, India. Though only less than an hour by road from Kathmandu, Nepal's capital, the bustle, dust and noise of the city seem far away. Here, at the heart of Pulahari, is the stupa temple. Inside is the golden stupa of the Jemgun Kontra Rinpoche, a holder of the Karmakaju lineage and heart disciple of its supreme head, Jalwa Karmapa. A Buddhist master held in great esteem by many, the third Jemgun Kontra Rinpoche passed away on April the 26th, 1992, but left behind a wealthy legacy of examples he showed in his lifetime as a Buddhist monk, disciple, master, guide, and human being. Third Jamurambachi's vision is all like uh, uh, according to Buddha's teaching. He want to help for all sentient beings, you know, whichever way that is the, his always wish. But the Rigpa Doji Institute is one of the, his wish to complete. He been working that for quite a long time with uh, our architect Lama Tenzin. Having a uh, Rigpa Doji Institute in here is because of uh, Third Jimur Rinpoche. He travels uh, different parts of the world, then he can meet many different people. And then because of that, then he think uh, he want to have an uh, institute, Buddhist institute in here. Then especially he dedicated that institute name for his teacher, 16 Kamapa. After Karmapa passed away, uh, whatever Rinpoche do the uh, religious and like social work, whatever he start after Karmapa passed away, he dedicate uh, to his teacher's name. Rinpoche he been to uh, like all over the world, east, west. Tibet, China, everywhere in the world, and then especially in this part of the world, you know. And then he think he should have a very good Buddhist institute where people can learn the uh, uh, Buddhist uh, view. He was relating with like Western student, Eastern student, and, and then, same time, he have a wish to uh, have a light monastery, Sangha, which can go continuity of like a Buddha activity. In Tibetan Buddhism, we have a reincarnation. Of course, Buddhist point of view, uh, we are all incarnation, but especially for like uh, reincarnated tulku, it's very important for continuity of carrying on Tibetan Buddhism. Many people believe that Rinpoche, you know, it's like precious jewel, because he is doing like his work, like jewel, you know. That's why until today, continuity of one, it's like, especially for Tibetan Buddhism, we can say this is the reincarnation of so and so Rinpoche. Third Jamur Rinpoche passed away in 1992. 
Now fourth Jamun Rinpoche is already nine years old and he is doing very well. He's study and he's uh, taking care, carrying on like continuity of Jamun Rinpoche's activity. It's, he is already taking care, you know, he is taking over. And then soon he will carry same light third Jamun Rinpoche again. can see the Tibetan Buddhism. There are reincarnation, Tulkus and Rinpoches. You know, that's very important that there are the, uh, like uh, one of the, like we call Rinpoche, means precious jewel. People believe them that way. And their activity is more, uh, uh, more larger than like ordinary monk. And they can lead monastery and that way carry on continuity until today what you see. Educating and training Buddhist monks and nuns is an age-old practice dating back to the time of Lord Buddha. It was brought back to Tibet more than a thousand years ago and continues today. At the monasteries of His Eminence Jamgun Kontra Rinpoche, the monks receive the traditional monastic training and education. By nurturing loving-kindness, compassion and wisdom, qualities inherent in all beings, the training that the monks receive benefits themselves as well as the others. The monasteries are fully responsible for the general welfare, education and health care of the monks. Traditionally, Buddhist families in Tibet and the Himalayan regions of Nepal and India offered their sons for monastic ordination. This custom continues today, particularly among Buddhist families from the remote Himalayan regions like Dolpo, Manang or Mustang, where these age-old traditions are still a way of life. Monastic system is very important. Sangha activity is the one of the source of teaching of Buddha. And then what you are having today teaching is also because of monk, nun, great Rinpoches, they are all monk and nun, you know, because they are the one who's really uh, continuity is they are carrying on. That's why Rinpoche think it's very important that monk community is very important for future generation also. Eastern and Western other uh, parts of the world students, they also need to learn the uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan way, you know, which they need to learn. Then our side also, we have to learn the uh, like Western point of view, which can suitable for us, you know. That's why Rinpoche think in the end, we all work together and then we can benefit for next generation. That's why you want to have this institute. It's not like uh, outside, like you have a school and you know lay institute. Name it same institute, but different meaning. You know, this institute should help for internal institute. What you have outside education institute is out institute. You know, this is a Buddhist institute. It's you have to look inside. Rikpe Dorje Institute building, which we're in, 
uh, was conceived by Jiang Kangchou Rinpoche III as a vast project. The original concept included the idea of a matriculated program where students would come and do two terms of study, but then it would also include during the off seasons uh, one month or three week programs where uh, a narrower group of people would come to do very intense study. Programs we talked about was a like a monastic gathering of all of the monastics from all, Buddhist monastics from all over the world who could come be with each other, discuss the problems of being a monastic and study the Vinaya. But there would be other intense programs like that. He envisioned that there would be a medical, a Tibetan medical college, that it would be ecumenical so that all of the four Buddhist uh, Tibetan lineages would be involved. But even there would be um, a broader uh, representation of Christians, Jews, Muslims, whatever. He did not want it to be his place. He wanted it to be a teaching place of the Kargyu lineage. I myself, I always work with him. You know, I'm like more like administration. When his lifetime, almost uh, uh, like I am always with him. I knew that uh, what he have a wish, what he want to do. But I always think that impossible to build this big building, but which he have a wish. But one day I asked Rinpoche, you know, it looks like a very big project where you will get money. But he told me that one day something can happen, you know. Then uh, that's what he say. Uh, after he passed away, we are very uh, fortunate that uh, from America there are Children Foundation who take over this project because of, I believe that they really have a very good uh, connection with Jamun Rinpoche. They think Jamun Rinpoche have a very good um, project, you know, then they say they will take over this. Today what you see is uh, their help. Then I believe Rinpoche say one day something can happen is really today what you see is happening. Originally I was introduced to the project in New York City. I had gone to see Jamgun Kongcho because I was planning to go into retreat, three-year retreat, and I uh, had only taken preliminary vows and was asking about taking additional vows. And uh, after the interview, he said, well, you're, you, you make drawings. And I said, yes. And he said, well, I want to build building. Could you make drawing for me? And then he said, well, but I don't have the information you know, maybe we can get together on Sunday. And I came on Sunday and he didn't have the information. And a couple of weeks later when I took my vows, after I took my vows, he, he, I asked him, well, did you want me to do something about the building? And he said, well, I don't have the information. And I said, well, I'm going on retreat in Europe. If you're going to be in Europe, I could meet you in Europe. And he said, no, I'm not going to be in Europe. This and, and I said, well, I'm going out to the West Coast next week. If you're going to be there, I could meet you there. And he said, no. And then I finally, in exasperation, said, look, I'll go anywhere in the world, wherever you want. And he said, oh, would you go to India? <laughs> I was only going to come for a month. And I had, you know, you can't design a building in a month. Actually, I was, we were only going to work on it a month, but we ended up traveling for a couple of months. And I kept encouraging him, let's talk about the project, because that way when we get to Rimtech, we'll have a start. I'll have thought about it and we'll know about it. And no matter how often I tried to initiate a conversation, it just would never happen. And then we got to Rimtech, and there was no real program, but I knew he wanted a library and a shrine room, a big shrine room, uh, and classrooms. So I made some paper cutouts of how much space we needed, and I went and I said, well, how do you want to organize it? I don't know anything about institutes. And he said, no, you first. <laughs> and I had thought about it, obviously. But something magical happened in that meeting because we, I, I mean, my image, a version of it is that he knew that I wanted, to, I wanted to please him. He was my teacher and I wanted to please him. So for a few weeks, three, four weeks, 
we worked quite intensely together. And I mean, for somebody, he had no training. And uh, this is a very complicated building. Every floor is different. So thing, you know, there's, and we were playing with heights, ceiling heights and floor heights and whatever. And at some point I said, look, it's, you know, we've been changing things very quickly and maybe it would be good if I spent a month or so just bringing it together and making sure everything really works. And I came here to Nepal. The building at that time was slated to be built in Sarnath, India. Somebody came along and offered to raise the money to build a building in India. And we went to the site and there were all kinds of problems. So Rinpoche decided, well, maybe we should not build here and we'll go to Nepal. He was building the retreat center here, the, what is now the monastery. So we came to Nepal, we spent a couple of weeks, and I pointed out to him that, you know, look, there is something magical about the site where the retreat center is. You know, that, you know when he would come here and spend a few days here, and then he'd come back to Rimtek, he would be glowing like a teenager in love. I mean, it was really something magical. I said, why don't we build there? You know, we have a piece of land and whatever, and we can buy additional land. And that's what we decided to do. And we located the building. We just, at first I had told him, you know, in Sarnath, India, it's flat land. Now we're on the top of a hill. We'll have to redesign the building. And I pointed out, well, look, maybe what we'll do is we'll build a big stone pedestal keep make it flat and then we'll build a building on top of it. And then he had to go to Rimtek for a few, um, well, less than two weeks. And I hadn't been home in quite a while, so I decided to go home for 12 days. And while I was home, he died in the automobile accident. And we thought the project was finished. I mean, nobody else would have the vision. There would be no way to raise that kind of money. So for years, we just forgot about it. And and then miraculously donors arrived from no place. I mean, not that we went out and seduced donors, they, they just came. Which is true of so much of what has happened here at Palahari and what has happened with this building. I mean, my feeling is that what's happened here, things happen well. Palahari, whole magic of Palahari being built when we didn't have a teacher to raise money. I mean, people would just show up and offer us money. So there's a certain quality of magic about the whole process. After the Third Jambu Rinpoche Parinirvana, 1992, Rinpoche already shared his view with the Kimbatsutum Rinpoche how to carry on for this institute. Kimbatsutum Rinpoche also agreed to help for Rinpoche and then of course, after Rinpoche passed away in 1993, Kimba Rinpoche carried on. Though we didn't build Rivedoji Institute, but Rinpoche have wished to build that. But Kimba Rinpoche already started that continuity of Jammu Rinpoche's view, step by step, slowly. Today, it's already 12 years. Of course, Kimba Rinpoche, he started in this temple, you know, teaching and everything. First we started in front of Jammu Rinpoche's stupa it's here and then Jammu Rinpoche he sit here and he keep teaching in here until this year. And same time Jammu Rinpoche he teach to now our uh, uh, Dupen Kempo who is a like junior Kempo. Now they are already Jammu uh, Rinpoche give them responsibility to carry on for uh, activities. This year we moved to Ripetoji, uh, we call Mahamudra Temple. For like uh, Eastern, Western lay student can come here and have teaching, and then also monastic uh, system like uh, two different kind. You know, we give the ones that they come to like uh, certain uh, grade of education, and they have a choice if they want to go for like deep. Buddhist uh, like philosophy and they can go for Sheta in Kalimpung 
we have an institute in Laba. And then if you want to go for continuity of uh, uh, having ritual, especially like Marpa's tradition, tantric pujas, how to make mandalas, how can uh, do the puja, how can make dharma, how can carry on the like monastic system, you know, they can do in here. Of course, institute also have that, but this part is more for like a ritual. That part is uh, more for like uh, philosophy. In the end, these two has to come together again. It's like two eyes. Here at Pulahari, there are more than 250 monks. 17 of them are in the fourth traditional three-year full retreat. At the Jamgun Kontral Monasteries in India and Nepal, all the monks undergo the eight-year basic curriculum covering traditional training in memorizing and reading of scriptures, the various aspects of Buddhist philosophy, rituals, music, dance, arts, and Tibetan language. have some monks, like Lama Uyazir. Lama Siri. They are uh, belong to second Jangun control in Chinsiyu's lifetime. We can learn a lot from them. They are traditionally what they do in second Jamun Kuntu lifetime and then how they found third Jamun Rinpoche, how they search, how they ask Karmapa, how Karmapa give answer. That way we have to learn. That's why I did that because of hearing from them I have an idea what to do. That's why, for me, my own experiences of searching fourth Jamun Kuntu, I went by myself to see Karmapa request, he recognized, and then um, when we found the Rinpoche, like we have a general secretary who is like second Jamun Kuntu general secretary, his name is Changzhe, we call general secretary Yenten Punso. He is like second Jamun control uh, general secretary who is taking care of Jamun Rinpoche's main seat in Eastern Tibet. Even in Cultural Revolution time, it was all destroyed. And then he was the man who carried on again continuity. In 1984, we reestablished. And today, its retreat is going to continue. From 1984 to until today, during the Searching of fourth Jamgun Kongtul, he also came up from east to central Tibet. We meet together in uh, capital of Lhasa, and we went together to see Karmapa, and we all went to search Rumbachi together. We found Rumbachi, and then he can share because they have more experiences than us, because we are born in, in India. He's from. Eastern Tibet, I have to learn many from him, especially like Lama Wezere, Lama Seri, they are the old traditional monk, you know, 
because of that way we have to do. Otherwise, in 1959, everything is gone. I am like a new generation, you know, because I don't have a experiences of uh, like searching reincarnation. And uh, in 19, end of 1992, our general secretary, Chang Tzu Yen Ten Pun Tso, he came to uh, Nepal. Then he and I have a long talk. Then he was sharing with me that uh, I was very, very depressed, you know, because of Rinpoche passed away. I was very sad. And then he is older, and he give me lots of strength, you know. He said, now things in Doji, there will be, we have to carry on continuity, and you should be strong. And he said, there will be again reincarnation, fourth Jamul Rinpoche will come. Then he share his own experiences of how he searched third Jamun Rinpoche. He was the man who found third Jamun Rinpoche, you know, and then he gave me all his experiences of how he searched for third Jamun Rinpoche, because I have no idea. And this is the like continuity of learning from him, you know. And then when I searched Jamun Rinpoche, when I found, he also came to see Rinpoche. Then two of us have same experiences, you know. Both of us very happy, you know. And then we work together. Today's curriculum also includes general education in the national and English languages, mathematics and general studies. artwork in the Rigvedoji Institute is a huge, it's a very large field. So there are no way to accomplish by one people. So it's a big, uh, the 
achievement of the big group of people, the many artists. When we start the art world, we invited many different artists from the outside. Outside means the local people. And also, we have a, our monastery have a few monks who have a good experience about the art. So we all work together. And uh, my main responsibility is uh, those artists who come from the different field or different place. The, everyone has a different experience and different style. And also I learned uh, each people's skill. And then we divided uh, each one's uh, different responsibility. Some are very good for sketching. Okay, you do sketching. Some are good to make a decoration or landscape. And I asked them, you do landscape. And some are very nice to, you know, their hand is very straight and straight. And then to draw the line and the patterns. So each one I give a different responsibility. It's a big uh, job, you know. We have uh, over 16 artists. Then the whole tanga become the same style, as if painted by one artist. All the work has to be in the same pattern and the same design and according to our need. That is the one big thing. And then secondly, the color combination, which is very important. How to play the color. The, in terms of a uh, combination of the color, and then how light you want, and how rich you want. There are many ways to decorate the artwork. And here, we have uh, two types of artwork, the two traditions. The, in terms of a coloring, the decoration on the building, we follow very strictly the style of sandal tradition which you will see a lot in the uh, central Tibet. The Eastern Tibet and the Central Tibet, they have a slightly different the way how you combine the color. There are also many traditions, but we choose the Tanga, especially the tradition of Kamakadi. The Kamakadi is very famous in Kamakaju, which start from the 10th Kamapa. Those Tanga's colors are very light. It's not very rich. So this, you will see the two differences. The art decoration also, it has to be based on the structure. When we start the building, and also we discuss how we're going to decorate, and how we're going to color. And then, based on that, we already reserve the space. Our main priority is to preserve the, this uh, uh, precious culture. And of course, always to make a good decoration is a great offering, offering to the Buddha and Dharma and Sangha. So there are two aspects, offering to the tribal gem, and the other hand, also preserving the, this uh, precious uh, uh, culture. Basically, the building, it was originally designed for a flat site. So you enter the building or you come to the building from on the uh, shrine room level. And it was the shrine room, which is quite unique in that it has like 40 foot span between columns, which could not be done in Tibet. I mean, it was just not impossible. But this was done, Jamgam Rinpoche did it in uh, Rimtek. Shedra in uh, West Bengal, India. And that was his first instruction to me, that he wanted the shrine room to be like the one at Rimtek. And that's what it was. It was a 40 foot, roughly 40 foot span. So that's where we started. Then he also asked that there be a colonnade around it. He wanted to be able to do kora or circumambulation around it. So basically that determined the size of the building. But it is the central space, the colonnade around it is incredibly spectacular here at the top of a hill in Kathmandu, overlooking the valley. And we were able to 
uh, design it so that in front there's a series of well, like a portico where you enter and we've decided that that will be a place where they could do uh, initiations outside. They could put thrones up on the portico and the people could sit like an amphitheater out in front. The next thing he wanted was a library. Yeah, the library is basically conceived as the students. It's not a library for the public, or it's assumed that it's going to be to a large degree a, a digital library. So we've designed in carols where students can set up with the computer and uh, books and then leave everything to come back and, on longer projects. This library is specifically designed, and that's where we are at the moment, for both Tibetan Pechet uh, text and uh, Western types of text, both in Tibetan and in English. Tenzin Dorje, who is who the, uh, the general secretary, was very insistent that the library have the dignity of Dharma. It should just exude dignity so that all of the woodwork, everything has been done, um, you know, extremely well to maintain that. I mean, the wood ceilings, the wood paneling, everything. Panorama, I mean, it offers two things. Number one, it looks back on the monastery, it looks back on the Kudong Lakung, where they remain, the uh, Kudong, the sacred remains of Jamgung Kongchuller in the stupa. But also, you can see in, and you will be able to see the statues of Manjushri and the text and so forth. So the, the Dharma, the presence of the Dharma is pervasive. Then on this level, which is one level above the shrine room, on each side of the shrine room is the, our classrooms. There's six classrooms uh, on each side. Then in the center at the back, there's a communications room, toilets and facilities, the lockers for the students. Basically, they can come here and have all of their needs satisfied right here, on this, almost on this floor. Then up above is the Shamata Shrine Room, or the Lineage Shrine Room, actually. Right now it houses a small golden stupa with the hot relics of uh, Lodro Taye, who was the first Jamgum Kongtrul. And it will also house a, a similar identical stupa with relics from the uh, 16th Karmapa. Rick Bay Dorje, who was institute, was named after. Then crowning the other end of the building is Karmapa's suite, which is basically uh, consists of two levels. One, a kind of reception level where he can meet students, you know, small groups of students. And then upstairs is, is basically just a residential suite. There's a small living room, dining area, and a bedroom. But that also is the level of the main roof so there's a huge roof area that will give him panoramic views of in four directions above the valley and the mountains. In the back of the building, it's eight stories high. In the front, when you enter from the front, it looks like three stories high or something. It's quite a different change of scale. Because the build project, most of this was designed for India on a flat site, but here we're on the edge of a hill. And it slopes down quite steeply, so there are three levels below the main shrine room. And the level immediately below the main shrine room around the edge of the building is resi residential rooms for teachers and um, special guests, um, and an upper level of the dining room. And then down on the lowest, on the next floor below, is a dining room, kitchen, and other utility facilities. And in the middle, and underneath this 40-foot span, which is in the main shrine room, we added an auditorium, also for about 200, and everything works out for about 250 people, except the main shrine room, which can accommodate six to 800 people. And Jamgam Rinpoche wanted big windows. He loved windows. I mean, in a number of situations, there were choices of put window on one side or the other side. And he says, why not both? 
very unique. Traditionally in Tibet the windows are quite small. Retreat centers, everything has very tiny windows. But even when I designed re retreat center for Jangam Rinpoche, he wanted big windows, a lot of window. He liked light. And very specifically, and though this building is not intended for just Westerners, he felt that Westerners needed light, they needed views. This is called the Mahamudra Shan Hall, or Shamatha, Mahamudra Shamatha Hall. When the time came for the decoration, and we were thinking what we can do, since there is an eight panel, it will be nice to put this eight practice lineage. And also people known as uh, eight great vehicle. And during the Lord of Thai's time, he summarized the whole practice in Tibet into eight categories. And each practice has a lineage history and the practice sadhana, empowerment, and instruction. And out of the five treasure, treasury uh, written by Lord Thayye, and this is one <coughs> called the treasury of instruction. So each one has a complete uh, history, the lineage history, empowerment, instruction, and sadhana. So out of the eight uh, practice lineage, from the right side, the first tanga is about the Nyingma lineage. And then the right side, the second tanga is the about the Kadamba, Kadamba lineage. The third Tanga is about the Jue, Jue practice. Fourth one is uh, Jordu, and the founder of this lineage is uh, Jonangba, the Jonangba lineage. The middle, the, the main teacher is a Dobo Basharab Jatsin, who is also founder of Shendongba school. And then left side, the first Tanga is the Mabakaju, the lineage of the Mabakaju. Then second one is uh, the lineage of the Sakya practice. Third one is uh, the practice lineage of Shangwakaju. And fourth one is uh, the practice lineage of uh, Dorji Nyenduk, uh, brought to Tibet by the Kedu Urjinba, a great uh, scholar. And he is also the teacher of third Kamapa and student of second Kamapa. Though his practice lineage uh, derived from the different stream, but especially in the Kamakaju lineage, we got from the third Kamapa. And until today, that practice is exist. In Tibet, when you build a temple, the brackets and the beam and the pillar, all they use a wood. And it's very easy to carve on the wood. So they do a lot of a carving as a decoration. But here we build uh, all this whole structure is a cement and steel. So, but still we have a good way to decorate. So 
First, we complete the first phase of the plaster on the top of plaster, and then we again put a one layer of the plaster. Then we print whatever decoration we want to do. Then we carve on the wet plaster. And then in the main shrine hall, also we have to decorate there. And I was thinking now what we can do, decorate on the wall. So when we, we look, there is exactly the 12 panel. And it's very, it fits very well with the 12 deeds of the Lord Buddha, which is the life story of the Buddha. Since we are the Buddhist, it's very important to have the Lord Buddha's life story. Now we are painting those tangas. Some are finished, some are on the halfway, some are just starting. So it will take another few more months to complete. And I asked the Lama Tenzin one day, did you talk with the Janggur Rinpoche? When you are designing the building, which tanga going to be placed? And Lama Tenzin told, no, it just came spontaneously. But when I think about that, I feel it's so, I mean, auspicious. And the main shrine hall fits exactly the 12 panel, which is the 12 deeds of Lord Buddha. So we put a more, the base on the life story of Buddha. Right. So once we finalize, okay, this is okay, yeah. then he will wipe up the charcoal, then we go with the pencil. main artist who does the whole sketching work and I often discuss with him and I give him direction I want this drawing here and I don't want this and I want this and that so when I look at generally many tangas and that I visited many temple you know everyone uh, paint uh, Lord Buddha's uh, life story and then, the, in terms of design, there is a lot of mix. Some are Indian style, some are Tibetan style. But I choose in between. For example, like uh, the Siddhartha, well, he was in the royal palace. And he enjoyed with the, his life in the royal palace. And for this uh, part, the most of the tanga, most of the uh, old tanga, they put a brocket and the same costume of Tibetan king. And for example, here I decided something different in between the Tibetan style and the Indian style. Instead of putting all the Tibetan, all the king costume. So I choose a, more like a, the ornament or costume of Sambhavakaya. Actually, the Sambhavakaya is a cost, the ornament of the king. Uh, in the main shrine hall, there is a big uh, fall ceiling. And this one, I've been thinking for a long time, so what kind of decoration we should do. You know, we should not be too much colorful, or we should not be too much plain. So we have to make uh, something which is uh, match well and relevant. And there is uh, no the place to divide it. It's just one flat, big ceiling, and we are looking something very simple. And finally, it just came in my mind, maybe, you know, just draw the dragon, just cover with the whole space. That also, we don't want so much colorful, which should be very simple. And in terms of working, it's much more faster than others, because only two color. And also, it gives a very nice feeling. Sometimes, when you look during the daytime, it just, you feel like a sky.
the main entrance which you have seen the mandala on the ceiling. That one called uh, in Tibetan is a Gendin Dunkor. Gendin Dunkor means the Sangha gathering chakra. That's why we're having so many little kids here. <laughs> uh, and that one is also uh, discovered by Lord Thaye. Then inside you will see mainly the 16 Arhat. And the four gardens, gardens and the four celestial palace. In March 1992, when the third Jemkan Rinpoche was planning the construction of the eight stupas in Pulahari Monastery, he remarked that by doing this, immeasurable merit could be accumulated. Generally, any virtuous action with regard to the three jewels, great or small, has immeasurable virtues. Among them all, the construction of stupas is deemed to be one of the most virtuous and meritorious actions that one can do. On the top floor of the institute building, young monks are preparing sacred scriptures and images, colouring them with special saffron water. Later, the texts are rolled and wrapped in five different coloured threads, symbolising the five Buddha families, and then placed inside the stupas. As night falls, monks are gathering in the stupa's temple. Here, evening prayers are being performed every day in front of the golden stupa of Jemgun Control III.
After evening prayers in the stupa temple, the monastery is still far from sleeping and the monks are starting their evening session of memorizing texts. While the young ones are memorizing their scriptures on the main courtyards, the older monks from Pulahari are being challenged in the philosophical debates by fellow monastic students of the other Jamgun Kontra Rinpoche monastery in Lava, Darjeeling, West Bengal. <laughs> Amen. Oh,